leaving my mic on just because I was asked to be the young say. So. <clears throat> Not that there's much to do. Not sure if my mouth will work tonight. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to Pennsylvania snow. <laughs> well, I shoveled. Yeah, I shoveled the uh, just the area right around my front steps and porch at about four o'clock, and I went back out at about six o'clock, and it looked like I hadn't done anything. <laughs> <laughs> I I missed that part of the country. Yeah. Okay, fun, let's man. do let's do a heart sutra. Okay. Together. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on Massa Vulture's Mountain on Raja Griha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom 
and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavada Kateshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavada Kateshvara said this to the Venerable Shadadvati Putra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhi, Soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi soha tayata gate gate paragate Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi soha. Gari Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commanded the Bodhisattva, commanded the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryavalakateshvara, saying, Well said, well said, some of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Vadakateshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised. That's spoken by the Bhagavan.
Now we will request for Lama to teach us the Dharma. Set up differently. That's not going to work. Sorry, I can see that that's too small. So, so this right here. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater, common and extraordinary approaches. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it looks like they're considering uh, uh, retreat Zen, you know, so the white um, or kind of off-white Zen uh, is generally uh, worn if, uh, in certain schools if you're, um, you know, on retreat. Uh, there, there was a time when I asked people who had taken refuge to get a retreat Zen, so uh, they remind themselves that uh, for Vajrayana practitioners, we all promised to do um, a long retreat at some point in our lives. Uh, and that we even think of uh, ourselves as being on a continuous retreat. Um, so uh, we're wearing a, a shawl to remind ourselves of that. Um, I'm not going to ask you to. Uh, I'm not going to ask her to sit outside and do do more practice. <laughs> but uh, it sounds like the weather is appropriate for that. So um, <clears throat> I'm wearing a traditional moon sen right now. That my uh, retreat sen is in the temple. <clears throat> so sometimes people have uh, their their different styles. There's some uh, shawls where the red bands on either side and the rest is white and um some where the, it's varied color like that um so uh the very plain uh zen is easy to get to so um i asked at some point that if people wanted to wear that after taking refuge to remind themselves to to be on retreat uh, so it's funny, there's little identifications. If uh, if you have a, a shawl has some, um, like, a, what would these be called? Like a fringe, you know, then, uh, uh, you know, you're a householder uh, uh, or retreat yogi. If you, if you don't have a fringe, then you're, um, then that would be uh, a monastic style like that. <clears throat> so today, uh, tonight, we're talking on uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra again. Uh, so to give some background. Uh, one way the um, Tibetans uh, organize the Dharma uh, and uh, in India too, is through talking about the three turnings of the wheel. The wheel is the uh, uh, Dharma chakra, symbolic of uh, teaching, or symbolic of a universal um, chakra varta. It's called universal emperor, like the Buddha, who uh, is pacifying the whole environment, not just your individual mind. Definitely, we could use, uh, and we should think of ourselves ultimately as chakravartins. Um, or uh, Buddhas with our own Buddha field in the Lotus Sutra um, and in other sutras too. Uh, sometimes the Buddha would uh, predict someone's uh, future um, awakening, and not only that, but said, "This will be your name, and you will have a Buddha field." So actually, that's our goal is. Uh, 
to be awake to be a Buddha. And um, if you so uh, desire, you may, you could have your own um, Buddha land or Buddha field. <clears throat> However, uh, even though we say the Buddha spontaneously teaches and is compassionate, uh, after um, being involved in sanghas and temples for 50 years, I think Buddha fields need some maintenance <laughs> on, on the relative level. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the absolute level seems to take care of itself. But if you uh, want to be a teacher, uh, let alone a Buddha, you can plan on spending a lot of your time talking about maintaining your Buddha field, right? So... <clears throat> The first turning of the wheel um, corresponds with the Buddha's uh, first teachings, like at the Deer Park, teaching the Four Noble Truths, uh, Eightfold Path, and the Twelve Links of Interdependent Origination. Uh, these first turnings of the wheel are meant to be very concrete and direct and uh, easy to understand. <clears throat> Sometimes they're characterized as individual liberation uh, or um, hinayana, but uh, generally, just in a completely open way, we'd say first turning the wheel. Uh, however, at some point, uh, the Buddha began talking in a different way, uh, and we just chanted or sung or spoke uh, one of the... Um, main sutras or teachings from the second turning of the wheel, the Parjnaparamita teachings. Uh, so uh, not all of the second turning of the wheel uh, teachings um, are Parjnaparamita, uh, one very famous one like the Lotus Sutra I taught on it several years ago. But uh, these second turning of the wheel uh, teachings uh, come off as quite different. Definitely Heart Sutra, for example, the Parashamparamita Sutras are um, almost negating everything uh, from, uh, you know, fundamental first turning of the wheel. Isn't that so? <clears throat> if you go back and examine it, uh, uh, most of the key teachings are, there's a no in front of them, except for uh, Prajna Paramita, the wisdom that is going beyond. Uh, it's explained in the Uttaratara Shastra, the one we're reading now, Buddha Nature, that uh, the, the Buddha felt that people uh, become too attached to uh, these literal teachings, um, had stopped too soon in their training, um, had uh, begun to uh, concretize things too much, and had forgotten that not only is... Uh, the personal self, empty of inherent existence, in other words, able to exist on its own, but phenomena as well are empty of inherent existence, have no uh, <clears throat> fundamental essence from their own side. They have to exist independently, in other words. <clears throat> so the second turning of the wheel, uh, uh, which many Tibetans see you know, as Prajnaparamita is the paradigmatic way uh, to express the second turning, generally um, is involved in uh, emptiness, right? Talking about shunita, talking about emptiness. Um, we, we can't really find anything that has uh, independent existence, not even emptiness itself. Um, <clears throat> and using like a Madhyamaka approach, we can say you, you really... Um, have to give up all kind of conceptual elaboration altogether. And, and maybe uh, we can't say anything about the absolute except um, uh, statements such as it is, it, it is empty of inherent existence. Maybe we can't say anything positive. We actually can, but the tendency uh, in uh, the second turning of the wheel sutras that are prized in paramitas, tendency is we could be coming a little nihilistic. So we could say, well, emptiness means nothingness or everything is taken away. So uh, at the Buddha's time, when he was teaching these uh, from Vulture Peak, for example, uh, 
some people apparently uh, did go to a nihilistic point of view, uh, which is in uh, going the wrong direction, right? And the other wrong direction would be a substantialist point of view that everything exists. However, the Buddha did say that if you have to go to one extreme, it's better to go to eternalism and everything exists than to go to nihilism. Uh, it's more difficult to talk people out of a nihilistic stance, which I'm sure from time to time, all of us have been in. So the second turning the wheel, we could get attached to emptiness and therefore uh, the Buddha taught um, or the future Buddha, Maitreya taught also to a Sangha, the third turning the wheel, um, which has to do with the sometimes called the um, Tathagatagarbha Sutras, uh, teaching mind only, like Chittamatra, Yogachar. And this is quite a departure from uh, the Madhyamaka kind of approach. So today we're going to go over uh, the positive qualities, of course, of uh, things. Remembering, however, to not discard either the first turning of the wheel or the second turning of the wheel. And that's what makes the path a little bit difficult uh, in the, um, the program that the Tibetans put together because they wanted to, and they still do, want to integrate it all. And um, I'm hoping I can help you integrate it all from first turning the wheel view where um, the self might not exist as we think it does uh, in a solid way. Of course, it has a relative um, existence, but that dharmas or uh, certain kind of experiences or certain kinds of things do exist um, inherently from their own side. The first turning the wheel uh, usually contains what's a lot called Abhidharma, which are lists of uh, things. Um, the six is this and the seven is that, and the three this is. And uh, the Abhidharma approach is an attempt uh, in the first turning the wheel, and to some extent the second turning the wheel, like the Abhidharma Kosha, to explain what experience uh, is like if we didn't use our personal self as the center point or owner or container of the experiences. That's difficult to do. Because usually we're always going to say, well, my thoughts, my feelings. It's kind of weird to say, my thoughts are empty of any personal uh, side, you know, things like that. So the Abhidharma is an attempt to explain or map out all of our experience without reference to uh, an Atman or even reference to uh, uh, a personal self that exists inherently. I, I am interested in going over Abhidharma, um, but uh, the Abhidharma um, approaches uh, like uh, through Abhidhamma Kosha or Abhidhamma Samakaya um, tend to be very geeky and very detailed and people tend to get bogged down a bit. So uh, my idea was to teach Abhidhamma after we do uh, um, Mahayana approaches. So uh, a little bit backwards. <clears throat> We've all done some Abhidhamma uh, training anyway uh, because we live in California and America, and the uh, Theravada and Abhidharma teachings have become extremely popular. So if your meditation approach is to uh, sit quietly and watch your breath and notice thoughts coming and going or, or labeling thoughts and letting go of them, that's an Abhidharma approach. Sitting quietly, noting this is a sensation, this is a pleasant sensation. This is a thought. This is an emotion or compounded factor. Um, this is a perception. That's an Abhidhamma approach. If uh, you've been reading um, the Shamatha book that I've suggested for many years, Calming the Mind, which is a record of a retreat with Gen Marimpa, um, and goes over shamatha in detail. There's nothing at all about uh, labeling and noticing thoughts other than noticing whether our general overall approaches 
agitation or depression. You're not you're not told to uh, uh, just watch things and let go, are you? There's absolutely uh, a little bit, of course, but uh, there's absolutely no Amer reference. And maybe a scholar could find to just talking about impermanence, right? And shamatha practice, we're not looking at impermanence. We're not looking at uh, no self. We're not looking at noticing that claiming is suffering. We're just trying to balance the mind, become concentrated, and have it very, very still and very, very strong. Isn't that so? If while I'm talking and you can contradict me, I would be interested in learning about it. So the shamatha practice we're doing is very uh, geared towards uh, uh, a really clear mind without necessarily being interested in uh, outer objects. We use outer objects, so to speak, like a, an object, like even the breath, we could say is something before the mind. But uh, we're not we're not sitting there analyzing thoughts and feelings and emotions and bodily sensations very much in shamatha at all. Don't you think? We're just going for pure concentration. However, if you've been doing shamatha for a while, trying to do it, um, this our, our style, so to speak, it's very difficult, right? It seems easier to sit quietly and kind of watch our thoughts. But there's nothing about watching our thoughts in shamatha. We actually want to, in shamatha, come as close as we can to have uh, uh, mind paying attention to mind or just become concentration itself. So we don't even have a subject-object dichotomy. Uh, we're after uh, actually samadhi. So this one-pointed concentration or samadhi or uh, 10th or 11th style um, shamatha practice um, isn't about impermanence, is it? It's not noticing um, no self, is it? It doesn't go over the unsatisfactoriness of uh, samsara, right? None of that. So uh, when we get to talking about Buddha nature, similarly, when um, Maitreya and Asanga, and particularly Jamgun Control, as, as well as um, Campus Ultrium, Ramshe, uh, we're, not, we're not looking at impermanence at all, are we? We're looking to directly identify uh, with uh, Buddhahood itself, with Buddha nature, and to notice, however, what are the adventitious, the, um, the false imputations on mind. But I'd like to just let that sink in for a second um, because the style of meditation we do is quite different than uh, the Abhidharma, uh, you know, Theravada meditations. And uh, the Mahayana kind of crossover Abhidharma texts like Abhidharma Kosha and so forth um, do have some meditations in them. But once again, they're moving towards meditation that is stabilizing and concentrating um, and not being, uh, not noticing uh, the factors of impermanence or no self or unsatisfactoriness. So right away in our shamatha, we're training to a very stable mind because to see the Buddha qualities, uh, to uh, see the gold in the midst of the ore is uh, takes a very stable concentration. But I want to stop right there and see if um, I'm making sense to anybody or someone that would like to uh, bring up or challenge me on that point. <clears throat> All right. Yes. Is money the same as Buddha nature? Uh, Dirk was asking us if samadhi is the same as Buddha nature. Oh, that's you. Okay, because Dirk, Dirk says, no, I'm okay. <laughs> Didn't Dirk have his hand up? I don't know. I think so. <clears throat> uh, I, I had my hand up, but that wasn't my question. 
<laughs> let's, let's get you your want... question out too. We'll have two questions on that table. Uh, okay. Well, my question was, or, or, or I actually is kind of, you're making sense to me, but uh, are you equating uh, the Pashana meditation with Abhidharma meditation? And then uh, there's sort of the, the, the ancillary to that question is, are you uh, saying that shamatha is the, that there's a form of shamatha which becomes Dzogchen meditation? There's, uh, well, you're, you're anticipating my next talk at some point, yes. So right away, um, uh, I found that if we start with uh, a style that is creating the groundwork for Mahamudra and Dzogchen, then uh, it's a lot easier. <clears throat> so in uh, in all the deep meditative um, practices, we're we're looking to identify uh, the what's called in this translated in this book is um, primordial wisdom uh, that sees the uh, um, uh, clear light mind. Uh, sees uh, the true nature, sees the Buddha nature, sees uh, the nature mind itself. <clears throat> so the um, emphasis is um, only on analysis to the standpoint of distinguishing uh, what is uh, relative or what is adventitious and um, uh, what is uh, the uh, true nature of mind, true nature of reality. So um, I think that, you know one metaphor I use is that if if we come into uh, a room, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way: if we're if we're in a room with the lights are off, instead of uh, trying to figure out a way to walk very um, carefully through the room without bumping into anything. Instead, we uh, just use a flashlight or turn on the light. Where the um, Abhidharma approach is like, if we map out the entire room very, very slowly, um, kind of like mapping out a minefield, we'll be able to negotiate through the room and not hit any of the furniture. But that will take forever. So the emphasis is on uh, actually uh, just turn on the light or uh, turn on your flashlight or lamp and you will see uh, where the passageway is. So you will see the open space. You don't have to chart where all the um, furniture is. Or likewise, if you're sailing, you, you, would, you would know where the rocks are uh, and you would be able to sail through the channel. So it's not necessary to um, look at every uh, thing individually and find out where it is and find out whether it's helpful or not helpful or empty or not empty. Uh, we just uh, turn on the light and uh, walk out of samsara, so to speak. Um, well, let, let me get to Connor's question. So um, <clears throat> I don't think in this text, uh, <coughs> Maitreya Sangha or Duncan Control is equating samadhi with, with Buddhahood, uh, unless you call it like Maha Samadhi, where uh, we're not moving from uh, uh, the primordial wisdom that sees uh, things as they are. So th there's, uh, would be like a Vajra Samadhi, so to speak, um, that, uh, you know, we, we could say the, the Buddha would be and samadhi with um, uh, that awareness would not fall back, um, would not have any doubts. Um, but usually the way the you know, samadhi is used as part of the meditative process, but we can talk about, um, you know, samadhis of uh, uh, different qualities and things like that. But probably here in the text, um, John Good Control's uh, Talking about the actual sitting practice and uh, developing real samadhi uh, 
on the nature of reality. And then uh, in the post-meditation practice, um, uh, using discriminating wisdom to see how the relative world arises. So this is another unique quality about this text uh, and the commentary <clears throat> commentaries on it is that um, so much emphasis is put on uh, sitting meditation um, to see the nature of mind uh, directly in all the Buddha qualities and uh, the activities in the daily world, coming in touch with other people, having to make decisions, uh, activates and promotes the other form of primordial wisdom, which is the uh, discriminating or prajna side. So it's not using the sitting meditation um, in an analytical way uh, that uh, we, we can also do, but uh, using it in a, a very stability style way and then using daily life to see the differentiation of phenomena. So that itself is a big difference too. I've taught people how to uh, different styles, like one style that I, I like and emphasize in darshan is like, okay, training is what you're doing on the cushion and then daily life is uh, practice. Because in training, we have perfect, um, hopefully perfect situation where all the um, outer distractions are removed. So uh, we create a perfect situation to uh, see directly uh, what's happening, kind of like in a lab, where in daily life practice, it's spontaneous. Uh, things happen out of our control, and therefore uh, we're going to see the relative nature of things clearer that way. And when you combine the two, then you're going to have a full practice. So the style of practice, I emphasize, uh, even when we're doing analytical practice on the cushion, uh, is uh, still this style of practice where you use the meditation time uh, to go deeply into um, uh, the clarity and cal calmness and uh, vastness of the mind, uh, and then use our daily life, so to speak, a daytime world. <laughs> Um, to uh, develop our discriminating wisdom. And then there was another question. Yeah, okay. Hi, Morris. Hello, Lama. Uh, my question is, is, is sort of an apples and oranges question. Uh, it, when you talk about um, uh, clear light, and is that the same thing as Rigpa, or are they related? Um, maybe they're twins. <laughs> <laughs> That's dualistic. Pardon me? That's not dualistic. Oh, I'm, I'm just kidding. Oh, OK. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, depending upon who you're listening to and reading, sometimes, uh, you know, the, the language of different systems are compared to each other. So, um, okay. uh, you know, that's, uh, that's whole, a good discussion like that, right? Thank you. Usually clear light um, terminology, so to speak, is uh, used more uh, in the uh, Mahamudra system like that. You'll find that language in the Mahamudra system, not as much in uh, the Dzogchen systems like that. <clears throat> There's some wonderful texts. Um, I don't have them in front of me by uh, Nipa Mirbache and, and other teachers that um, point out the um, complementarity and uh, uh, 
similarity and that uh, different systems are getting at the same point. Um, uh, the Dalai Lama's article I've mentioned a number of different times, the one in Calmness, Clarity and Insight, where he goes into depth comparing the Dzogchen and, um, and the Anuttara Tantra approaches, right, like that. <clears throat> so I, I took, I've taken, of course, many Dzogchen impairments, but um, uh, fortunately I was able to um, take some from uh, the Dalai Lama at one point. <clears throat> and he's very good at um, not not saying everything's the same, <laughs> but not saying everything's uh, different. He uses kind of a phrase like, they all seem to be getting at the same point. Uh, but uh, he's very careful to point out that uh, um, uh, generally in the uh, Tantra systems, we have to gradually purify um, the adventitious stains, the impurities where uh, in, uh, in Dzogchen and Mahamudra were trying to look directly at uh, the nature of all the phenomena and see the essential purity. <clears throat> but what I like about the Dalai Lama is he's very honest about his own experience and um, you know, will relate um, his progress also. It's quite humbling. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Somewhere. Hi, James. Hi, Lama. Good evening. Um, I have two questions, but I know a lot of people have questions, so I'll go to the one that's more uh, fascinating to me, which is okay. in the text, there's a lot of conversation about the bliss state and cultivating the bliss state and the benefits of cultivating the bliss state. Yes. And a lot of times when I've done meditation, I've been encouraged in the past not to try to cultivate any particular state of mind. Uh, and that that's a trap. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, how do I know if I'm experiencing something that is like the bliss state or I'm experiencing something else? Well, what's the difference between uh, uh, the worldly Dakini and um, the enlightened Dakini? Probably a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, generally, um, uh, kind of a sensate kind of bliss, um, you know, maybe lowercase b, is, is going to be time limited, right? And dependent upon causes and conditions. So, uh, you know, that, that's, just time, that's just time limited bliss, right? So we, we would have to repeat the causes and conditions to get that bliss. But uh, once we're talking, uh, particularly here, third turning the wheel, and we're talking about the bliss of liberation, or um, even talking tantric bliss, it would be uh, something that is stable and um, not um, brought about through causes and conditions, because um, the blissful uh, nature of the mind is inherent to the mind. So um, if if the if the bliss fades, it's it's worldly bliss. Doesn't mean it's not good. You know, that's we 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 just know we'll attached if we um, you know uh, create suffering as a result that we don't want to see it go. <clears throat> So, of course, there's the bliss of liberation. Um, nothing's really better than, you know, real freedom. Uh, so, and also there's uh, the bliss of the bodhisattvas. So, um, there's the bliss of, uh, you know, we, we get to help out. There's, there's uh, we get to serve. There's no, um, it's just great. You just feel like that doesn't go away and then, uh, when, when that's completely immovable, then um, uh, that that joy in helping out is permanent. 
So we, particularly with the Buddha nature, we have to think, you know, what, what's permanent, what's, what's really there, what's stable, <clears throat> like that. So uh, in Shamatha, of course, Shamatha is still uh, traditionally seen within um, the desire realm, right? So um, the, uh, uh, the, the bliss brought about by Shamatha could be very long lasting, right? But it would still be um, uh, until you recognize the true nature mind, it would still be uh, uh, temporary. But temporary bliss uh, that comes through meditative states, like really understanding things, the bliss of understanding uh, is a great inspiration. So um, in our tradition, um, uh, we, we don't have a problem saying uh, we're uh, interested in attaining certain insights and states of mind um, like that. Uh, we, we don't mind saying that, uh, you know, relative states of mind um, are enjoyable and uh, can be uh, and, and must be helpful to attaining ultimate states, ultimate meaning unchanging and, and permanent like that. So, <clears throat> What, what, what we would say is <laughs> uh, you, you have to be patient and, and work at it. That um, At first, meditation is very difficult, and it's a walk up hill like that. But it feels good when you get to the summit and take the pack off, don't you think? <laughs> so uh, in Tantra, particularly, um, we're not discarding at all you know, relative states of mind, we're just noticing that they're relative states of mind and they come about through causes and conditions. <clears throat> but in the third turning the wheel uh, teachings, uh, the Buddha said, well, actually there are uh, things that uh, don't come about through causes and conditions. And we can say more about things than just that they're empty and clear and knowing. We can talk about all the Buddha qualities of patience and the paramitas and love and so forth. Like that. It's a big one. We do want to cultivate uh, uh, permanent bliss because with, with bliss we're more able to see wisdom. So in one of the Dalai Lama's um, uh, talks that he gave a long time ago, which I was researching tonight, uh, he said, uh, he translated it as ecstasy like that. <laughs> so I, I do have a rant um, against what I, <laughs> about dysthymic Buddhists. So, uh, you know, lo low grade depression is not a sign of meditative stability. That's a sign of sinking or laxity like that. I mean, we get to be depressed, right? Just their losses and um, horrible things going on, easy to be depressed about. But um, many uh, American Buddhists, from my point of view, are um, cultivating laxity or low-grade depression and thinking that they're developing equanimity. And they're just low, <laughs> they're just depressed Buddhists. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> These are good questions. The third turning of the wheel of Dharma is supposed to be uh, really uh, inspiring like that. So um, this a weekend while I was home, I tried a little experiment. So while I was um, reading, uh, <laughs> I don't know what number of time, reading through the sutra, um, I put on some Beethoven. <laughs> so uh, this rousing music, uh, you know, something like that, very inspiring music is uh, that, that kind of like, the words then popped out some more, you know, because um, uh, they're meant to be like that, very live. So then I tried like, instead of sitting down and reading quietly, I, I, I like stood up and walked back and forth reading 
you know, and there were like Emperor Concerto blasting in the background, right? Uh, so um, that, that kind of style is the real Mahayana style where um, I believe Bob Thurman has got it right that it's really uh, you know, very energetic and meant to be very um, uh, operatic and over the top. It's the antithesis of kind of chill out, right? God. <clears throat> so uh, you have to keep reading. I, I know some of the, it's repetitive, but each chapter and talking about each thing brings out a slightly different degree. So like all Indian texts, they go over things until the blood's coming out of your ears. But uh, each, each chapter or each uh, section introduces something new. And it's very easy to go, okay, there's nothing new here. So, you know, that, that would be a part where I can get into the details with people and say, well, actually, they're saying the same thing over again, but actually they're saying something uh, new and, and profound each time. Okay, so... <clears throat> Does it all make sense? <laughs> okay, <laughs> nodding, heads nodding. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> the other point I wanted to bring out tonight um, is from uh, an annotation that Kempo Soltrain points out. Um, and I'll mention again uh, in the text I was reading from the Dalai Lama, uh, if you don't have a strong sitting practice, uh, you're not going to be able to do Vipassana. And if you don't have a strong uh, background in uh, the third turning of the Wheel Sutras, you're not going to be able to practice Tantra. You're just not going to get it. So to... Um, practice Tantra, we really are looking for a very strong, stable awareness that isn't grasping and fixating on uh, compounded objects at all, and that is able to bring uh, enthusiasm uh, and bliss and energy uh, in a balanced way into awareness. <clears throat> so um, I'd just like to read something from Kempal Sotrin to shout him out here. Uh, <clears throat> according for the people that have already done the reading of Nagarjuna, we'll start here. According to the Madhyamaka, however, the nature of mind is to be understood solely from the point of view that all phenomena do not truly exist. In this view, it is nothing but empty in the sense of not being accessible to any conceptualization. It's very important to gain a proper understanding of these two different views. What is mainly taught in the system to which the Uttara Tantra Shastra belongs is the aspect of awareness, Rigpa, or clear light, Ursul, whereas in the system of Madhyamaka, the aspect of emptiness in the sense of freedom from conceptual elaboration is exclusively taught. If one understands well what is meant by the inseparable union of emptiness and clear light, one comes very close to the path of Vajrayana. In the system of the Vajrayana, the nature mind is then described as an inseparable union of clarity emptiness, of bliss emptiness, of appearance emptiness, and of awareness emptiness. These are called the four joint manifestations. Without knowing the, the meaning of the inseparable union of spaciousness and awareness, one will not be able to understand these. Not having studied the views as presented in the Tantra Shastra and the Madhyamaka system, one will not come to an understanding of the Vajrayana where the four joint manifestations are introduced. One would find oneself forced to leave the level of the Vajrayana 
in order to study the vehicle of the characteristics that form its basis. Therefore, it is advisable to study this first. If, for example, someone learns how to fly a plane without being able to drive a car, he may one day have to learn how to drive while he can already fly. Since the first is also much more difficult than the latter, one had better keep the appropriate order. In brief, one should endeavor to study and understand the views of the Uttara Tantra Shastra and the Madhyamaka properly, since they equally constitute the cause of one's ability to follow the Vajrayana path. <clears throat> when uh, we're studying Garab Dorji's three uh, points um, and attempt to see into the nature mind, if we're going there with a strong conceptual overlay, then uh, we're not going to make it. If we're going in there with uh, a weak concentration, we're not going to be able to appreciate it. So uh, uh, there's uh, the value in, in uh, the Madhyamaka approach that we can notice and quickly notice, see where we're grasping onto conceptual overlay. How to distinguish between like a strong conceptual overlay and authentic experience is the point, right? So that's where you hope that you have a teacher that is able to distinguish those. <clears throat> because uh, the conceptual mind, the mind that uh, is able to create uh, generic images and uh, fool itself that those are real, um, is, is very tricky. So that's why in the Vajrayana we say you, you really need uh, a teacher that is able to uh, notice what what's something that's made up and fabricated and notice also the unfabricated state. It's not enough to be a teacher, just say, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm dwelling in the unfabricated state, which is great. <laughs> I'm just dwelling in Rigpa or clear light or whatever. Uh, if we're not able to distinguish when we are fixating again, and we're not able to distinguish when uh, we're working with others, then uh, uh, we won't be able to manifest uh, the full uh, Dharma. And it's tricky. It is, uh, as uh, hopefully people studying with me should know. And um, I've said to people over the years, like, well, I'm sorry, that's um, a conceptualized structure. I know you're very in love with it. And you seem to have, uh, it seems like a genuine experience. Um, but uh, a mirage while driving down the hot road is a genuine experience. I'm not saying you're not having something. It's just not water. <laughs> so uh, it, it won't quench your thirst. Uh, it's a beautiful mirage. Yeah, so that's fine. So when I've told people that conceptual overlay, I'm not saying you're not having some kind of experience, right? But it's not the uncompounded, unfabricated experience of uh, Rikpa. It's not that. Besides, if we, um, if you get mad <laughs> when you're told that um, no, that was an uncompounded direct experience, then that should tell you something, okay? <laughs> like that. So, <laughs> so we do need, uh, in addition to this uh, structural background training which is developing our strength and our receptivity through reading and studying and interacting, uh, we still need uh, direct pointing out instructions, some way that's uh, a translation of pith or pith instructions. And uh, uh, the pith instructions are, can be written down, but the pith instructions are when we catch ourselves in the act of being ourselves, or our teacher catches us in the act of uh, being ourselves. So it isn't just catching you being bad, like I caught you in conceptual overlay, because that would be a very long catching, would be going on all day. No, I'm looking to catch people. <laughs> and uh, when 
uh, the conceptual overlay has temporarily uh, developed a gap or dropped off to point out the nature of mind, right? It's not necessary for me to go around pointing out how people are being silly or selfish. That would take much too much time. <laughs> I'm not interested in doing that. You know? <laughs> so what's, what's important is that we have someone who can say, yeah, that's, that's it. You know, so recognize that and stabilize that experience. So and I can't have a lot of students and do that, um, but I don't need a lot of students. But we do need to do more retreat. Uh, we do need to spend more time together uh, in person. Uh, so, you know, I look forward to that. So if you all can stay healthy in whatever means you seem uh, best to do that, uh, and that we can uh, meet in retreat or meet in darshan like that. So maybe maybe we have some a couple last questions before um, we sign off. There's a hand going up off camera. Yes. Which annotation was that, Wangala? <clears throat> Which annotation? Um, hmm. Oh. I'll find it. <laughs> traditional traditional teaching would be there would be these kind of racks of pages or flat pages, and the Lama would spend like the next half an hour going to the pages, but I'm not going to do that to you. So. <clears throat> but I'll get back to what the annotation was. Yeah, so um, the, the emphasis on uh, shamatha, of course, is uh, stillness. And I, uh, you know, which it starts with, um, well, just sitting still, sitting in one place, um, not getting up when it's uncomfortable, um, staying with it until you don't feel like going anywhere else. And I know that's very difficult and in America, uh, everyone's interested in movement meditation, and that's necessary too. But uh, we also have to see um, the non-moving nature of mind also, uh, which is particularly um, emphasized in the third turning of the wheel. So I know people have been uh, under the influence of uh, uh, you know, the first turning, or sometimes uh, we call Hinayana teachings when I say, uh, what's the nature of reality? And they go, everything is impermanent. So, um, we don't say everything is impermanent. Well, actually, even in uh, Theravada, we don't say everything is impermanent. Nirvana is permanent, right? Cessation is permanent, even in Theravada, right? So only, uncom only compounded phenomena are impermanent, correct? Four seals, four seals, uh, compounded phenomena are impermanent. Things that are made of parts will fall apart. <clears throat> Tainted phenomena are suffering. So when there's conflict, we're going to suffer. We don't get what we want, we get what we don't want, that's conflict. And then all dharmas are empty and selfless. And finally, the most important part really is nirvana or Buddhahood. Uh, we could equate those as uh, peaceful. The uh, Buddhas, uh, high bodhisattvas, the teachers that we love, they they're, they they engage with the world. So there's going to be uh, intensity there, but internally they're they're not in conflict. What do you think? Uh, you, honestly, you, uh, you, you, teachers that aren't in conflict can create wonderful aspects to bring people together in sanghas so that we learn to work together peacefully. But uh, if teachers are in conflict internally, generally they will try to repress or stamp things down and 
um, you're kind of quasi fascist group, and then the conflict will bubble up later and explode. I think some of you have seen that already. So um, in our Vajrayana approach, uh, we, uh, we're we after peacefulness, uh, but we understand that there's differences and there's uh, creative differences that can be intense in the Vajrayana world, but they, they don't lead to real uh, hatred or conflict. We can be angry with people uh, without hating them, don't you think? So um, uh, the Dalai Lama even said, you know, Dalai Lama gets angry, but uh, hate is something different. So we can be, we can have conflict in the sense that we have differences uh, and we can work with those. And that's one reason we'll be studying uh, debate in other sections of the program. So um, I think I've attracted students um, and people in my life that like uh, good debates. <laughs> so it's getting uh, it's getting late for people that are in a different time zone. So unless it's uh, a burning issue, we might say good night. But uh, I, I hope you will continue to read Uttara Tantra Shastra. And um, you don't have to put on Beethoven, fine, if you want to put on something else. <laughs> but uh, the text is meant to be reading uh, grandly and with inspiration like that from that point of view. Okay, so why don't we do like closing? We have just a closing. Come up, I guess. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi Tenzin Jatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Mahang, so please enjoy your meditation and life. See you next time. Ciao. Bye-bye, Thank you, Lama. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That was Thank fun. you, Lama. Yeah. Enjoy Thank you, Lama. <laughs> like Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss, but make sure it's uncompounded permanent bliss too, right? Oh, <laughs> Not just temporary bliss. <laughs> the bliss of liberation, the bliss of helping others, right? Bliss of liberating animals too. I would like to do some animal liberation practices at some point. Uh, so we'll talk about that, I hope, right? Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. Bye, well, Lama. Be nice to your animals. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>